welcome to another Truth Loader uh, live debate. Today we're talking about the Oscars because it's that time of year again when everybody in Hollywood and many of you guys at home are going to be discussing who's going to get their hands on that shiny award on Sunday. It's a time of year when all those actors so desperate to get their hands on an Oscar go on the talk shows and turn on the waterworks. Hugh Jackman, uh, caught off guard, opening up like never before. I've wanted to be a, an actor since I was a little girl, and I've worked for a really long time. I don't like to get emotional, but I know exactly what it was. I just can't stop crying. <laughs> oh, look at her. You are going to cry. <laughs> stop it. Indeed. Stop it. So, away from all of the crying, there is in fact a world of campaigning that wouldn't be far wrong on the presidential campaign. Directors and producers go pedal to the metal to make sure their movies get talked about. Take, for example, uh, this clip of Harvey Weinstein, who was talking to a reporter about whether or not he was enjoying his time at the L Style Awards. It feels great because Bradley Cooper got recognized for an scintillating performance in Silver Linings. You know, this guy just knocked it out of the ballpark. There is no movie without that. It's the central performance of the film. So you can try to be subtle about it, and I stress try, but occasionally that veneer that you've built around yourself can dissipate and your true intentions come through. And I don't want to, because I'm here to sell my movie. This is a commercial for the movie, make no mistake. So, some movie studios are happy to spend up to half a million dollars campaigning to make sure their film has the best possible chance of getting its hands on one of those shiny Oscars. So are the Oscars as much about lobbying and campaigning as they are about recognizing great film talent? If you've got some thoughts on this or questions or comments, leave them in the YouTube video because we will be able to put them to our panel. So I should probably introduce you to our panel of guests who are going to be helping us get to the bottom of this very question. We have Roger Simon. He's an Academy Award-nominated screenwriter and a member of the Academy. He's going to be with us for just 15 minutes because he has a very pressing time. So thank you very much, uh, Roger. We also have Matt Achity, who's the editor-in-chief of Rotten Tomatoes, and Peter Rallis, a film critic and YouTuber and the founder of the Rallis Review website. So, Roger, I'd like to come to you first. You, you are a member of the Academy. Um, behind all of the glamour and glitz, what are some of the underhanded tactics that you've come across with people trying to get their hands on an Oscar. I wish I could tell you that there was a lot of shenanigans going on. But, but it actually, not that much compared to the old days. In the old days, when I was first of ever, it was really funny. And uh, the, 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 most, the ones who were most guilty of it were the French, of course, because they would have these lavish parties at the uh, French consulate in Los Angeles to get you to vote for their film which I really miss, and I could hint to the French, they should still do it. Uh, but, it, but, it but it became illegal. The Academy got very fussy with trying to make everything seem like it was legit. Uh, so it really is a kind of a legit election, and underhanded tactics, I don't think they work so well. So who decides which films get nominated, uh, Roger? Uh, in... Each votes in his own branch. For, for example, in the nomination, I voted uh, to nominate in Best Picture, but also in the two screenwriting divisions, Adapted and Original Screenplay, the actor, the actors vote uh, in the nomination for the actors, etc. But uh, everybody votes for the Best Picture nominees. And how long, uh, how long does the voting process take? And does everyone just get one vote? I mean. I Forgive me, I don't know the voting process, and if you could explain it to our viewers, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, we appear to have lost Roger Simon there, into there, the wrong There's only the about, I, I think, uh, the, about 6,000 members of the Academy now, right now, so they're, they're a small group. Uh, that, yeah, there are 6,000 or so people who vote, and, and this year, for the first time, they vote online, which created a lot of dilemmas, and it will be interesting to see if, uh, if it's as difficult as Google Hangout, because uh, they, were, you know, they were calling us up, literally, and giving us passwords and trying to make sure 
that uh, the Chinese didn't hack in and all the rest of that stuff. So as far as you're concerned, Roger, it's a fairly even-handed and fair process. Um, but Matt Archity, let's come to you. Some of these studios and directors are happy to spend up to half a million dollars campaigning to get their film to win an award. Why is getting one so important to these studios? Well, it's a couple of reasons, uh, not the least of which it's the it's a badge of honor. You know, some of the most important, mo some of the most powerful people in Hollywood are basically saying that you did the best this year in your particular category. Uh, and that gets a little bit reflected at both the box office and on home video. Uh, it's good for business. You know, if you look at the movies that opened up at the end of the year, things like Zero Dark Thirty, things like... Uh, Django Unchained, things like Argo, uh, those all saw a bit of a bump with the nominations. The best example of that is a movie like Amour. Amour got a nomination, had not been seen very much, but when that movie hits home video, people are going to seek it out in a way that they probably hadn't done before because it just by just by the nature of the nomination. So I think that it does have a corresponding kind of bump in the revenue. So, you know, it, it's almost, you can think of it as, as one of the best marketing tools that's out there. Uh, now, granted, you know, it doesn't necessarily hurt a movie like Avengers or, or uh, Dark Knight Rises, which didn't get any nominations. But I think for some of the smaller movies that are more, quote, unquote, important, I think you do see kind of a bump with both the public and really kind of the prestige of your career. Uh, Roger, if I could come back to you, because I know that you're pressed for time, uh, and then I'm going to come to Peter Rallis. Roger, I've got this question that I'm interested in. Uh, is it a very chummy affair? Like, Hollywood is, is a place where lots of people know each other. If you're well-connected to people inside of the Academy, is it much more likely that your film is going to be nominated for an award? Uh, in certain divisions, it's true. I think, it, it, ironically, it's, it's very true in the more obscure divisions like editing and sound and so forth because uh, those are smaller clubs. Uh, you know, for the big acting and awards and so forth, there's some sentimentality. I mean, an older actor who has never won one, but everybody loves, will get a nod. Uh, nobody cares about us writers, so that won't happen. <laughs> but but uh, it does happen in the acting divisions. Uh, but, but basically, you know, I hate to tell the public, but unlike most elections, the Oscars are a remarkably fair election. They reflect the taste of the membership. Is there anything you can do that is pretty much going to ensure you are not going to be nominated for an Oscar? Is there a big taboo, a big no-no that you should steer well clear of if you want to get your hands on that golden statue? Roger? <laughs> Oh, Roger seems I think we're watching the Matrix trilogy at the moment. <laughs> Peter Rallis, uh, uh, I'd like to ask this question. Every single year at the Oscars, something gets nominated where people say, how on earth did that get a nomination? And how on earth did this great movie not get a nomination? Why do you think that is? And can you give us some examples of movies that should have been nominated that weren't? Well, I think the uh, the big uh, snub I think this year was uh, Ben Affleck not getting nominated for Best Director for Argo, especially because he won the Golden Globe, he won the Directors Guild Award for it as well, and even won the Best Ensemble for that entire movie. Um, that's kind of the big one that I saw this year, which was um, something that um, I thought should have at least been in like, the category of things. But uh, recently, because a few years ago when The Dark Knight came out, there was a big uproar about it not getting nominated for Best Picture. So they kind of extended that, uh, the Best Picture category, into just, well, however many movies that people liked. And then you kind of get some more movies in that category, which kind of bring itself to the surface more, kind of like uh, what Matt was saying about how that's good publicity for its movie itself. Uh, but this year, there wasn't anything that really... It kind of came out of left field. I think all the nominations this year, um, except for that director thing for Ben Affleck, uh, seemed to be uh, and, um, the, the right nominee. Maybe, maybe you could explain why you said that uh, he'd been snubbed. Do you have a theory as to why he may well have been snubbed for the Best Director award? Uh, well, the well, the kind of the odd thing this year is that the uh, the movie Amour, which is usually um, usually foreign films, there's a specific category just for you know best foreign picture, but this year it seems to kind of. Uh, 
We've been invaded again <laughs> by the Matrix trilogy. Uh, so, Matt Hattachi, if you can hear me. Um, yes. Do you think that it's often been discussed that a lot of the times the votes take place on films that the Academy members haven't seen? Do you think that goes on? Uh, I, I think that they've done a good job of keeping that from happening in recent years. You know, this year, um, and, and Roger probably knows this too, you know, screeners have been sent out for, um, you know, for the shorts, uh, so to make it easy for Academy members, they've changed the rules for the documentary films to make sure that everybody can see them. Um, but you know, that, that was always the joke, especially about the documentary films. In fact, a few years back, and I can't remember which film it was, but the film that had won for best documentary, in his acceptance speech, the doctor, the the winner had basically said that he had kind of gamed the system in that he had only stat, he'd only had a couple of you couldn't vote for the award unless you'd actually seen all of the movies and the Academy had proof of it, and he had said in his acceptance speech, well, he kind of stacked the deck because the only screenings of his film, he had made sure that it was all of his his chums in the Academy. So that's, that's part of how he ended up with that award. Um, they've done better about that. They, they do want to make sure everybody sees every film. Uh, so I think that it's been, they fixed that and it's, it's more, it's less of an issue than it used to be. Roger, I know your press for time has come to you. We're talking about people being nominated and winning an Oscar. Uh, you were nominated uh, for best screenwriter. What did that feel like? Uh, it was an out-of-body experience. Oh, dear. I mean, I, I think, you know, writers are, are private people to some degree. So when a, when a writer gets nominated for an Academy Award and walks down that red carpet with actual movie stars, it feels very weird, I have to tell you. I, I, and and you're, you're sitting there and you know a billion people are watching. You know, uh, that's more than Google Hangout. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would be very pleased to learn if one billion people are watching this right now. <laughs> If there are a billion people watching, hit that subscribe button because you'll get some more great debates yeah, like this. Have we been joined by some additional people at the bottom there? Um, if you've just joined us, because I know we had some problems with some of our guests getting into the Hangout, as we always do. Um, if you've just joined us, please could you introduce yourself. We're talking about uh, how the Oscars really work. This is a story that keeps on. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, it's Andrew O'Hare in New York. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us. I know you have, we had some problems getting you in earlier. Um, we were just talking, Andrew, about whether or not people uh, vote on films they haven't seen. Um, so what do you think, is there anything that stops people from voting on films they haven't necessarily seen? Do you, do you have an opinion on that? I don't think there's anything that stops them from doing it. What, what I hear from the Academy this year is because every single member got screeners and in some cases even digital screeners, they didn't have, even have to open the post you know, to get them, that uh, there's less of an excuse than there usually is for people not watching the movies. So earlier, uh, um, Andrew, we were talking about some of the studios spending up to half a million dollars to campaign on their movie. Um, how important do you think it is to market your film to get it that Oscar? <laughs> It's very hard to say from the outside. I mean, the conventional wisdom is that campaigns don't work. Um, in some cases, they spend millions of dollars on these on these campaigns. It's like a political campaign. But um, I, I don't know if I believe that they don't work. I mean, they, they they sure they spent by some accounts as much as ten million promoting Argo, and we all think that that worked out pretty well uh, to this point. So I'm, I'm I'm skeptical of the 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 position that it makes no difference and that it's going to turn out the same way anyway. I, I think campaigning, a lot of which is behind the scenes, is a very important part of it. Well, and if I could just jump in here, I have to say that the campaign the campaigning at least clearly worked for a long time for the Hollywood Reporter and Variety because that that was a significant part of their business model was the for your consideration ads, the ads that that the studios and 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 would put out uh, specifically targeted at Academy members. Sorry, was someone replying there? I think someone disappeared during a reply there. Uh, Matt, are you saying that that campaign trail no longer works? 
I, I don't think that it. I, I think that it probably still works, uh, or at least enough people believe that it works that there's still a lot of money spent. Um, but you also hear stories about, you know, I. I I, I, you hear stories about why the Weinstein, you know, why Harvey Weinstein will not only spend money but do a lot of handshaking to the point that he's, you know, literally sending people door to door to Academy members' houses to kind of, if not twist arms, at least plead their case. So I think it's not just about the money. It's a lot of, you know, it, it's Hollywood is, is a very insular community. You know, it's, it's uh, yes, there's, it, it, there's only five or 6,000 people in the Academy, but that's, you know, the people that really, um, you know, that's a large slice of the people who are making movies and really are in the power positions. And and again, you know, it's it's a very it's a very insular club. And I think that, you know, the not just the awards uh, nomination and and kind of campaigns, but a lot of it's a lot of personal relationships. You know, the the joke is that the academy votes with their hearts as much as they do anything else, which is why to Andrew earlier points we see a lot of people will you know vote for someone who's getting older and they want to make sure that they you know acknowledge that person Christopher Plummer is a great example not that he didn't deserve that award but the conventional wisdom is you know there's there's a certain idea of well we better give it to him while we still have the chance <laughs> I'm so, glad you come back to you Andrew um, you've just joined us uh, we've been talking about how important many people find these Oscars. People shed tears on the campaign trail. They talk about the movies nonstop. Do the Oscars actually really matter? Yeah, yeah, that's such a complicated question. I think it's a great question. Um, sometimes they matter economically, not always. We've all seen examples like The Hurt Locker, which fails to make any money despite winning the you know, best picture, best director, several other awards. Uh, but it makes a difference. What's, uh, the way somebody put in, in, in the Academy put it to me recently, it's a tombstone question. Anybody who wins an Oscar, the first line of their obituary when they finally leave the planet is going to be, they won an Oscar in 2000 whatever for whatever movie it is. It's going to be the thing for which they're remembered as long as people are still interested in the motion pictures. You know, and that's so it's it's an it's an it's a it's a way in which an actor, a director, or a producer can make a mark that they think will not be erased twenty, forty, a hundred years after they're gone. Um, I have a question here from uh, one of our viewers on YouTube. It's the first question I've read out so far. It's from End of the Road one hundred ninety, and it's a bit of a left field question. Maybe Peter or anyone who'd like to really, but well, Peter, I'll direct this question to you. Um, how do screenings for the Oscars leak so many good? Films. So this is a question ultimately about piracy because, as uh, you'll know, piracy films often come copied from DVD screeners. So how do these films leak out? Um, well, it's weird because usually when they hand out the screeners, there's some kind of watermark that directs it back to who owns it. Um, so it must be like someone's kid or nephew who must have took it and put it up online. But there was an interesting study about just piracy in general that because of like the shutdown of mega upload, that actually movie theaters are seeing a lower attendance because of these websites being taken down because what usually happens is that someone will watch the movie illegally and then say, oh, that was a great film, and then recommend it to their friends who actually then end up going to the theater and seeing the film. So it's kind of a tricky uh, position because in one sense it actually gives, I mean, as much as that is not a good thing, it actually gives an opportunity for some people to see the film that they may not have an opportunity before in the past, especially like and people live in smaller towns uh, who don't get the limited release films. It's, you know, as much as that's, it's hurting companies, also helps in a way, too, that actually gives more word of mouth than by having it being available online. I have another question here from one of our YouTubers. It's from Amnorta14. I'll direct this question to Matt. Uh, do clay animation films like Panorama or Frank and Weenie have an unfair competition over computer animated films like Wreck-It Ralph or Brie? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's more about the subject matter. I will say, you know, when it comes to Academy voting, I, I would say that really it's, the medium and, and the storytelling is less of an issue uh, or more of an issue than really how, you know, it's, it's more about the story and more about the presentation and less about, you know, whether it's cell animation or CGI. You know, I mean, if you're thinking CGI is, is not good, I mean, you can look at Pixar. Pixar's got a great track record with best animated film, and those that's they work exclusively in CGI. So I don't think it's really that big an issue. That being said, you know, if we're talking predictions, I think Frankenweenie's got a good shot, mainly because of its subject matter. 
Uh, you know, it's it's a movie about that really is an, a loving homage to old horror films, and I think that's really going to resonate to Academy voters who, as we've seen from that LA Times study last year, you know, mostly older, mostly older guys. It, it's I think they're going to vote for that the same way they voted for the artist. You know, if you'd ask me. In fact, I had said this. I, I thought there was no way that the artist, that the Academy would vote for a silent movie for their best picture, you know, as they're clearly worried about being more inclusive and, and having a broader appeal to the general audience. Sure enough, they give the artist to, which it couldn't be more niche. And I think that that's, you know, kind of the same reason we'll see Frank and Weenie get uh, the Oscar nod this year. Andrew, if we could come to you, we've, we've heard that, that occasionally the Academy will throw uh, a film up for nomination and indeed award a film uh, that you wouldn't have expected. Is there a kind of film that you will always expect will do, uh, do well? There's often cliches about the kinds of roles actors need to be in to get nominated. What do you think those cliches are? Well, I mean, we, we see some perfect examples this year. I mean, uh, a, a film about Abraham Lincoln, if it was any good at all, was uh, for sure going to get a number of Oscar nominations. And especially when you're talking about one of the great screen actors of our age playing an iconic figure from history and, you know, one of the greatest Hollywood directors uh, taking on the subject. I, I almost feel like Lincoln was too front-loaded for the Oscars in a way. It may wind up in the long run uh, hurting it, that it feels so much like an old-school Oscar movie that I think ultimately they're steering away from it. But but there's no question that the Oscars, I mean, I'm with Matt that they're struggling with now. They're thinking about um, approaching newer audiences to some extent, about not wanting to seem so old and stodgy, but at the same time, there still is a traditionalist element, if you will, which may account for the fact that Lincoln got, I think it's something like 12 nominations overall. It may not win in very many of those categories other than Best Actor. Peter, let's go to you. Let's say, ask the precise opposite of that question. What kind of film could you produce, and it wouldn't matter how good the film was, but it is, would be very unlikely to be nominated for an Oscar? Uh, well, the new trend seems to be that the Academy isn't too big of fans of superhero movies. Like, you can produce the best Batman film ever, but there's just something about the supernatural elements of films, maybe not always. If it's obvious, like superheroes, that's something that the Academy usually likes to... I'd like ignore, you know, it may, may make billions of dollars worldwide, but uh, there's something about, I don't know, it's maybe not, doesn't have as much class as some of the other movies. Um, that may be something to do with it, but yeah, it's usually the superhero stuff that I see the, well, except we're like, when they get nominated for like best visual effects, but you'll never see it for best actor or picture. So if well, you I want think... to win an Oscar, you should really stay away from, uh, from, from making a superhero film. Sorry, was someone about to make a point there? I can't make out who it was, but please go ahead. Right, that was, that was, that was me. I was about to say, well, the classic ex example of that was the fact that after The Dark Knight, um, the middle, middle film in Christopher Nolan's trilogy was passed over for a nomination. That was the impetus in many ways for increasing the nominating field from five to, you know, the amorphous six to ten that we get now. And still, you don't get those kind of movies in the nominating field. They'll, they nominate other things instead. Right. Well, and, and to follow up on Andrew's point, Dark Knight Rice has got no nominations for anything this year, not even a technical award, which I think surprised a lot of us this year. Yeah. And me, because I thought it was an awesome film. I've got another question that I'd like to put to um, Matt, if you would. This is off YouTube. It's from Directing Dude 95 He says this. Do you think the Academy will ever implement a new category like Best Comedy or something along the lines of that, which will allow different types of films to be recognized? You know, I think that that's unlikely, at least in the near term. I know that the Golden Globes separated out in a couple of categories, uh, most notably Best Picture. Uh, I think the Academy has experimented with that in the past. Uh, it, they had Best Comedy Director early on, um, but that only ran for one year. Uh, I, I think they're not going to separate that out anytime soon. You know, you sometimes hear uh, people... Uh, there's a push sometimes from stunt performers that there should be some kind of best stunt sequence or best stunt ensemble Oscar, uh, which I think they probably actually in the you know in this day and age of more and more CGI they probably missed the boat on that ever being a category. Um, so, uh, but to the original question of whether or not that we're going to see a best comedy, I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon. You know, there was the most recent 
closest thing to that was in the 90s. We, they were separating out the musical scores between dramas and comedies. And I think part of that was a response to the um, Alan Menken scores that won so many Oscars for that kind of renaissance of Disney animation, which was uh, The Little Mermaid and Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. And so they separated those out. And then, you know, Howard Ashman passed away and Alan Menken wasn't quite putting in the same level of work. And for a couple of years, you had some really weird nominees winning best picture or winning best score there. And then after about three or four years, they just put him back in the same category. So, you know, the Academy is not above experimenting with categories, uh, or at least historically. I think in this day and age, there's so much more coverage. And the media, you know, like every other aspect of the media, you know, the film coverage media, the film media covers almost every small aspect that the Academy is well aware that any decision like that is going to be put under a microscope and really shouted out, and that would be huge news. So I think that if they're going to do that, it, it would take a big sea change in the membership to really start thinking that way. Uh, because, you know, as a response to that earlier question, notoriously comedies are, are shut out of the Oscars. You don't see a lot of love for comedies. You know, everybody likes to nominate, and, and the Oscars like to give awards to the important films. So, you know, you don't see much of comedies, but then what's next? Do you see, you know, somebody, they want to put out a best action movie? I, I think that they probably, rightly so, are worried about watering down what the award means. I, I think Matt is... Uh, is ap oh, sorry. I, I have one question, and then uh, please do continue. Uh, it's, a, it's a question... Uh, it's a hypothetical question, Andrew. If you were a director and you wanted to win an Oscar, uh, which, well, sorry, a producer, sorry, which director would you choose to make the movie? Which actor would you choose to star in it or actress? And which subject matter would you choose? Well, I, I, think, I, think, we've, um, I think we've seen this year that, uh, the indication is this year that historical subject matter can work really well as long as you don't take it too seriously. Um, we've got... Uh, we've got a number of films that wrestle with history this year, and it, it seems like the one that takes the most lightweight approach may be the one that triumphs uh, in, in Oscar season. Uh, I honestly don't know how much... Obviously, the director matters in terms of execution. I think Andrew's been executed. We will come back to, <laughs> and, uh, to Andrew. Peter, perhaps you can answer the same, uh, the same question. If, if um, yeah, but it's kind of hard to create like a best ensemble of directors and actors because it all depends on the subject matter. But uh, yeah, but like Andrew was saying, like there is a lot of historical things nominated this year, um, and that kind of seems to be an easy uh, something to nominate just because you know it's you had, it pulls from real life, and you know, the real life stories always kind of bring more emotion out of people because you know they can remember or like either where they were when this event happened or they learned it about it growing up all through school too. Uh, Matt, maybe you could give us give us your uh, perfect ensemble of Oscar-winning credence. You know, if if I was a producer, I, I would go out on a limb and I'd say I would try and either hire uh, Steven Spielberg or Martin Scorsese to direct my film. Uh, I think you can't go wrong with those guys. I would make it something that's probably a period piece, uh, something that's historical, uh, that deals with a real, uh, relatively famous figure. If I can get away with it, I would make it have some kind of tangential, at the very least, relationship to the filmmaking industry. Uh, maybe not out and out about making movies, but something somewhat tied in. Uh, you know, and yes, I'm referencing Argo. I'm referencing Hugo from last year. Uh, and I would try and cast... Maybe a Leo DiCaprio. I wouldn't expect him to actually ever get nominated, uh, but I would certainly, uh, I would certainly probably cast him uh, or Daniel Day Lewis. I still have to watch so Daniel Day Lewis, Steven Spielberg, and a film that's maybe a little bit about the filmmaking industry. You're onto a short by winner. I have a few more questions here from YouTube. Uh, this is from Robot or Robotol. I can never get YouTube names right, so I'm sorry if I've read your name out wrong. Robotol one. He wants to know: Do you guys think? And let's uh, direct this question to Andrew. Do you guys think that the quality of the Oscar show and the public interest in the show has gone up or down? Andrew. Yes, here I am. Um, hi. Yes. I, I think I think the show is almost always terrible, um, and that's uh, 
that's been a consistent pattern. Every year they hire a new producer. Every year they announce. I, I, I think I think the show is almost always terrible, um, and that's uh, that's been a consistent pattern. So we have a, a new arrival who I'm, we'll come back to you in just one second, Andrew. Whoever yep. just joined, could you please turn your your speakers down because we are getting um, awful headphones in. Will probably be a better solution because we're getting some feedback. Uh, to, to Andrew, Andrew. Please do continue, Andrew. Yep. Oh, I, I was saying I think the show is almost always dreadful, and every year they hire a new producer, and they say that they've cracked the code, and they, they're going away from the stupidities of yesteryear, and it's going to be a wonderful new day, and almost every year it's a disaster. I almost wonder if it's a – Peter Travers of Rolling Stone believes it's a disaster on purpose, that they want people to laugh at it, and it, you know, they want it to go endlessly more than three hours so that the networks can sell sponsorship. Uh, I don't know if I go for the conspiracy theory but uh, that said the audience has continued to be pretty good it's certainly not what it was in the glory days of Hollywood in the 70s and 80s I guess but nothing is you know by the standards of contemporary TV the audience for this show is still enormous so we have a new uh, person who's just joined us here from YouTube uh, I believe you have a question for us if you could quickly introduce yourself and then pose your question to you Andrew Mask or Peter please do go ahead Hi, I'm uh, Chris Matone. I'm a student at La Roche College, and I was just wondering, um, do you think any movie or person got snubbed that you think should have got nominated for really anything, and why? Peter, do you want to take this one? Uh, well, I, I mentioned earlier that I thought uh, Ben Affleck should have been at least nominated for Best Director. Um, that was just kind of the big one that stood out for me the most. So you think the director of Argo, Ben Affleck, was snubbed? Uh, Matt, have you got uh, got any thoughts on this? Anyone who you think was so obviously snubbed this this year? You know, I, I think it's easy to point it at at Ben Affleck uh, for a snub there. But it, you know, if you look at the list of people that got direct got nominated for best director, it's really hard to pick who you would bump off that list. Uh, you know, I think I think Ben Affleck did a fine job with the movie, and I can see you know, especially as the momentum has gone the way of that movie of Argo, I, it's it does seem more and more glaring. But it's hard to even pick. You know, I, I wouldn't take Michael Haneke off that list. I wouldn't take Ben Zeitlin off that list. Ang Lee, I think, did a fantastic job with. Uh, Life of Pi, uh, and obviously Steven Spielberg and David O. Russell. So I, I, I think that it's hard to say, you know, Affleck is a snub. I would say I do think it's curious and kind of weird that the Academy doesn't match up the amount of directors with the amount of best film, but, um, you know, for what it's worth, I think that there are probably some snubs. I will say I think Dark Knight Rises got shut out of any of the technical awards, and I think that's partly as a response to uh, the you know the terrible events that happened in Aurora this year, uh, connected with that film. I think that the Academy does not like controversy. If there's one thing that they want to steer clear of, it's controversial choices. They like to play it safe, and it's not to imply that there's a group of them sitting around and saying, "Well, let's not nominate this." But I think that when people are looking at their nominations, they're thinking, you know, they have a bad feeling and a, kind of a bad taste in their mouth about what happened with The Dark Knight Rises. And even when it comes to technical awards, I think that's getting passed over in favor of other things this year. Andrew, have you got a thought on this, on, on anyone who's obviously uh, snubbed this, this year? Yeah, I, I think I think Matt makes some really good points about controversy, about the way Hollywood responds to controversy. And the obvious example of that was Zero Dark Thirty, which did get a Best Picture nomination. But honestly, seriously, when people look at these awards 15 years from now and they see that Catherine Bigelow was not nominated for Best Director for that film, they're going to say, "What the hell were you people smoking back there in 2012?" And you know, whether you whether you like or dislike the film, I think it has all the technical qualities that you're looking for in great direction. I, I agree that it's difficult to knock somebody out of that category. Um, and as, as far as Ben Affleck goes, he did a nice job with the film. It's a nice little film. At a technical level, it's not at the same level as some of the other films in the race this year. So I would probably like to finish this conversation with the question that uh, you can't have an Oscar show and not ask. Peter Rallis, we'll start with you. Who do you think is going to get Best Picture uh, best Actor and Actress. Um, well, I've noticed that usually the best indicator for who will win Best Actor and Actress is from the Screen Actors Guild Awards. Uh, so I would go Best Picture, Argo. Uh, best Actor, I would give Dale Day-Lewis. Best Actress, I'll give it to Jennifer Lawrence. 
uh, supporting actor Christoph Waltz and supporting <laughs> actress I'll give to uh, Anne Hathaway because she seems to just always get that for singing one song. Fantastic, Matt. What about yourself? Uh, I I would say that I I think the smart money is on Argo this year. Uh, you know, for uh, again, predicting the Oscars is is less about what should win and more about trying to predict how the Academy is going to vote. Uh, but I think that Argo is going to win. Uh, I I think for Best Actor, I think you know they shouldn't they 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 could just hand it to Daniel Day Lewis at the beginning of the movie, I mean, beginning of the show. I I think there's no point in making everybody wait for that one. Uh, I think Best Actress is a a little bit up in the air. I, I think that with her recent BAFTA win, I wouldn't count out Emmanuel Riva. Uh, you know, the, the betting odds have it between Jessica Chastain and Jennifer Lawrence. To Peter's point earlier, uh, the SAG awards are a pretty good indicator. The voting blocks of the Academy, the, the actors is the largest voting block of the Academy. And so chances are they're going to probably um, – honor Jennifer Lawrence. Now, what I will say is, as you're looking at the supporting categories, I would say that if you see a win, I think everybody's assuming Anne Hathaway's going to win for Best Supporting Actress, but if you were to see Jackie Weaver and even Robert De Niro win for Best Supporting Actor for uh, Silver Linings Playbook, I think that we should start rethinking about what that means, because I think, especially with Jackie Weaver, that could mean that the the Academy is really behind Silver Linings in a way we hadn't expected. That, of all of the nominees, is more of the actor's picture, I think. And, I, and we could see, I think if Jackie Weaver takes that award, we could see a big sweep for the major awards, like Director and Best Picture from, uh, for Silver Linings Playbook. I think that's a long shot, but I think that the telling award there may be the supporting actor and actress nominations. And Andrew, what about you? Well, I, I, uh, I like Matt's... Uh, complicated theory about Silver Linings Playbook. It's not going to happen. If I were putting money on the line in uh, in Vegas or London, I would definitely go with, uh, with Argo and Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, Jennifer Lawrence. However, my feeling is that one of those three is going to turn out to be a surprise. Probably not Best Actor. I think Day-Lewis has that one in the bag. But one of the other two could wind up going in a surprising direction. Yeah, I've noticed before that usually whatever wins the Golden Globe for Best Picture, the Oscar would go to something else. Like Avatar won the Golden Globe, but then it went to Hurt Locker. And then um, you know, I think last year was something different too. Unless it was the artist so both times, but maybe changed. We could, we could finish with our YouTuber. Um, you joined us halfway through the debate. Let, let me hear yours. I think it's going to pick up. Pick up. <laughs> Sorry, I had a bad connection. Can you repeat that? Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Who do you think is going to get best picture, best actor, and best actress? That's actually really tough. Um, I actually don't really know. I think they're really all great movies, and I would be happy with whoever wins. Uh, I think Jay Lewis probably has best actor, like uh, the guy said. <laughs> sorry, I don't know all your names. Um, and then Best Actress probably might go to Lawrence, but I'm not positive on that. And then Best Picture is too tough for me to choose. So there you have it. Thank you to all of our guests who joined us. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Roger, who was with us earlier. Thank you to everyone at home who watched. Uh, everyone who left a comment. We tried to read out as many of them as we could. We've all got someone on from our comment section to join the debate. We will be back tomorrow at 4 p.m. when we have a Truth Road Investigator live special. We're doing a live special on the live NASA Hangout. The Google, uh, sorry, NASA will be doing from space. So if you're interested in that, hit subscribe so you don't miss. Um, thank you for everyone who's joined. Thank you for everyone who's watched. And make sure you subscribe. Oh, I've been told I must also promote Thursday. Next Thursday at 7 p.m., the exact same time as this debate, we're going to be doing a debate on whether or not Iceland is right to ban pornography. Check out some of our videos on our channel and you'll see the promotion in there. We'll put a link to it in the description. So if you're interested in these live debates and you're interested in getting involved, uh, subs and if you're interested in porn, <laughs> and who's not, frankly, who's not, uh, do join us on Thursday at 7 p.m. That last comment has got the studio giggling with laughter. Uh, but I should probably say bye and thank you to um, all of our contributors and everybody who watched at home. We'll see you again next time.